From the East Texas Sports Network studios, powered by Texas Dairy Queen, a tradition of excellence, the ETSN Podcast, where Clint Buckley and Mike Graham offer their, offer their, well, they just talk. But who really cares? It's what they do best. It's the lowdown on everything high school football in East Texas. And now, Clint Buckley and Mike Graham. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Week 12 edition of the ETSN.FM podcast. Uh, I'm Clint Buckley, and I'm joined, as always, by Mike Graham. How's it going, Mike? Doing good. Playoff time. This is the best time of the year. I'm really excited about this. Uh, indeed, the playoffs are upon us, and we've got a full weekend of games going on this weekend in East Texas, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, we'll have our uh, state championship picks a little bit later on in the podcast, but uh, first things first, we've got a few playoff games to discuss this weekend. And uh, we'll start it off with our only 6A team in East Texas, the uh, Tyler Lee Red Raiders, who are in the playoffs for the first time in four years. What do they get for, for uh, making the playoffs and, and snapping that playoff skid? They get the undefeated Hewitt Midway Panthers in Waco at McLean Stadium Friday night. And uh, you'll be at this game uh, at the new Baylor facility. Uh, looking forward to it? Yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited to see that stadium. Um, and more than that, I think that if there was a time that you'd want Tyler Lee to take on a team like Midway, uh, it's right now uh, after that win last week, uh, you know, just really handing it um, to the opponent. And, you know, Zach Hall, uh, just amazing production. Uh, the running games come along. Their passing game is doing well. And uh, the, the defense is uh, coming along. And that was the big thing that they needed going into the last game. Yeah, um, this really is, you know, if, if you look at it, I mean, nobody across the state is really going to give Lee much of a chance this week. I mean, it's 5-5 five and five versus 10-0. and 0. Uh, Midway has some very quality wins under its belt from, from non-district, and of course they went through their district undefeated, and obviously, and, um, you know, they're going to be playing in their own backyard. You know, Hewitt's just a few miles south of Baylor, and um, they're going to have a lot of folks there uh, Friday night on hand. Um, but I think uh, w- what's unique about this game, as opposed to, your average run of the mill ten and zero versus five and five first round matchup is the quarterback on the other side. Uh, Zach Hall, we just mentioned uh, the Tyler Lee quarterback. He's had a tremendous junior season, uh, both on the ground and through the air. I guess the big question uh, about his game coming into the season was how much how much progress he would make um, as a passer, and I think he's he's handled the, that challenge very well. I mean, he's only uh, thrown I believe three interceptions on the season. And um, and one of those came last week, and we mentioned uh, their, their dominant performance, 75 points, a school record, 75 points uh, against Garland, Name, and Forest last Thursday night and a game they had to win, you know, because if they lose, they're out. Um, and they were fortunately able to get some help the next night with Rowlett beating Saxe and, and Lee getting in as that fourth-place team. But now they get midway, and it's, it's, it's going to be a difficult task. And the defense, while they did play better, um, still gave up a ton of yards on the ground. Still gave up over 300 rushing yards to Naaman Forrest. And um, you know the defense is going to have to have to play better. And if they're not going to if they're not going to stop the other team, they're going to have to force turnovers um, for the for them to for them to have a chance in this one. Um, force turnovers and get your explosive offense. It's averaging well over 40 points a game. Extra possessions, and I and I think they have a chance if they if they can do that. If if they can't force turnovers. And they're just letting Midway move the ball on them at will, like they've let most teams do against them this year. Then um, it has a chance to get pretty ugly. Yeah, yeah, you're you're exactly right. Um, I think that this game really hinges on on uh, how how many times the defense can stop them. And I think if you can stop them three times, you've got an offense that can compete fairly well in this game. I, I think that three stops is the magic number. And then obviously you're going to need a spectacular performance from Zach Hall. But that's possible. We've seen him do some amazing things this season. And and I think the best thing about this game in, in this situation in this season for Lee is the fact, and we talked about this last time we were on the podcast, is this is a very young team. Any playoff experience is going to be good for them. They may not know any better. They, yeah. may, they may come in you know, naive, you know, thinking that, that they belong on the same field, which is a good thing. And, and uh, not only that, but just setting themselves up for success their senior year. Okay, this is what a 10 and 0 team looks like and Exactly. and let's see how we hang with them tonight. Oh, here it goes, here it goes, here it goes, yeah. oh, here it goes. 
Also, uh, Friday night, a big one uh, in Tyler between uh, two of our um, signature programs in East Texas, two of the biggest ones we have, Longview and Lufkin, for the second time this season, will meet uh, in the first round of the playoffs um, at 7.30 Friday at Rose Stadium. I'll be on hand for this. Cannot wait. Um, you know, you saw the season opener, uh, a 44-14 Lufkin win at home. A lot's changed since then. It really has. Um, you, you look at Longview and, and the success they, they've been able to have. Um, with Tylen Miller, and now they've added Jamichael Hasty to that running back ma- mix, and um, getting getting some big passes when they needed to. I think the big turning point for them was that Monroe Neville game in, in the third week of the season. Uh, but in the, in the Longview game, just a disaster, uh, and, and things really got exacerbated at the at the end of the first half. Well, yeah, I mean, let's go back. It's fourteen to fourteen with two minutes to play until halftime. Lufkin gets a touchdown pass to go up twenty one fourteen. Longview gets the ball back with about a minute 50 to go. They fumble. Um, that sets up a field goal. Lufkin pushes its lead to 10. Longview can't pick up a first down on the ensuing drive. They have to punt with 13 seconds left in the half, and they make the mistake of uh, kicking it to the aforementioned Kiki Kuti, one of the most explosive athletes in our region. That was an 80-yard return. 86-yard punt return, um, You know, 17 points in, in less than two minutes, and it's 31-14 Lufkin at halftime. And you got to remember, too, that – um, Longview was replacing its three top receivers from this from a season ago, including Dorian Leonard, who's now at Texas. Um, they they were just trying to get used to not having Jamichael Hasty out there because he had um, the only action that Longview had had up to that point was that scrimmage against Ennis the week before, and Des Chumley um, struggled in, in in that game. Um, I think it was six of fourteen passing, and I think the um, the the fact that the the receiving core was all brand new. Um, I think that 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 worked against them, especially in the second half when you're down 17 points. Um, you got to be able to make plays through the air to get yourself back in the game, and they just weren't able to do it. But if you look at it now, Longview has a ton of confidence. I mean, they've won eight straight. Most of those games were blowouts. Um, they're feeling really good about themselves right now, and they're going to be playing with that added motivation um, to to right that wrong that went against them in Week One against Lufkin. Um, and so that that's something that that Lufkin's kind of have to kind of have to keep an eye on is 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 starting fast because you know Longview's going to be pumped up for the game and you would think that Lufkin would as well but I, Longview may be coming in with a little added incentive considering what happened in the season opener and the fact that they have so much confidence rolling into this thing Lufkin you know they're six and four but it's it's a, it's a it's a different six and four. I mean, their their four losses have been by combined like forty points or something like that, and their three district losses have come by. Let's see, they lost to Knack by three, John Tyler by two, and Ennis by seven. So that's what fourteen points. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's right. Five, no, twelve. God, my math is terrible. Hey, two percent. Sim- simple. Adi- two percent. I can't even do simple addition. So. Yeah, so I mean, um, so they've been in all these games, um, even though they've lost, um, you know, three district games going into this one. Um, it's going to come down to, I think, um, how Longview's defense um, attacks Lufkin because Lufkin's one of the most balances, balanced offenses we have in the area. They they are uh, really good on the ground with Stephen Sal, who's had a great season. Um, Trey Cumby is is a good passer, one of the best um, in the area, and you've got. Two great receivers on the outside in QT and Terry Mark, two FBS targets. So um, Longview's going to have to take take away one of those and, and make Lufkin one dimensional. And if they're able to do that, I think that Longview stands a pretty good chance of winning. I don't expect it to be a blowout like we saw in Week One. I think both teams are are, are at their best right now. I think Lufkin has kind of rebounded from from that difficult loss that they uh, took against Ennis. A couple of weeks back, where they you know fought tooth and nail in that game. I mean, it was forty eight forty eight. Ennis scores with less than two minutes to play, or less than a less than a minute to play. And uh, Lufkin's done a really good job of of bouncing back, and uh, it should be a lot of fun Friday night. Big John, Big John, Big Bad John. The John Tyler Lions and Texas High Tigers in a good old fashioned uh, East Texas. Um, Throwdown uh, going on Friday night at Lobo Stadium, seven thirty. Um, these two teams are familiar with one another. They've uh, opened the season against each other um, in in recent years. They've also faced off in the playoffs uh, a whole bunch of times over the last uh, decade or so. And going way back, they used to share the same five A district when uh, Texas I was a, was a five A school. So um, a lot of 
a lot of uh, commonality shared between these two programs. Um, we talk about John Tyler. Um, their defense is is uh, playing out of its mind. I mean, they really have been playing well all year, but these last three games, they've taken it to a completely different level. Last week against Nacogdoches, who has a really good offense. I mean, they averaged over 40 points a game uh, th- through 10 games. And John Tyler held him to 139 total yards. Yeah, shocking. Coronado Tolbert has been running over opponents. Did, did nothing right. against John Tyler last week. I think he got 20 yards. I mean, it was really bad. Yeah. And, and it, it's been fun um, statting John Tyler and watching their numbers grow. Um, Josavia Reese and Pierre Leonard, six sacks apiece. Um, you've got Jordan Owens with four interceptions. Some really impressive numbers out there. When when your when your leading interceptor is Jordan Owens, he's I mean no disrespect to Jordan Owens because I think he's a great player. I think you would agree he's he's also he's he's a great player. But you look at who else they have in that secondary. You have Bryston Gibson who has like four or five defensive touchdowns this year at the other safety spot, and then your two cornerbacks are Ike Warren and DeAndre Williams. Yeah, who who both you know are, are college caliber players. It's it's pretty obvious who they want to pick on, and it's not working out for opponents. No, not not, not at all. And um, you know, we mentioned how well JT has been playing defensively the last few weeks. Um, in the last three games, they've they've only allowed twenty four total points. Um, and I don't know how much you can get, uh, how much more dominant you can get. And taking that a step further. They have 11 non-offensive touchdowns this year. Now, a couple of those are special team scores, but they have several defensive turnovers that have led, that have led directly to touchdowns. Uh, we mentioned Bryston Gibson. Um, Ike Warren has a, has a pick six. Bryston Gibson has a couple of fumble recoveries for touchdowns. I mean, it's just a really well-rounded defense. I mean, they're solid at all three levels. They're good up front with Braylon Jones, Pierre Leonard, Jasavia Reese. Um, their linebacking core is good with, with Jalen Reese uh, anchoring that in the middle. And then we just mentioned their secondary. So um, it's really difficult to find a way to attack John Tyler's defense. I mean, not many teams have had success this season against them. And uh, that's going to be the goal. Uh, that's going to be the the uh, the chore for Texas High's offense this week. And while Texas High has, has um, played played pretty consistently on offense, um, I, I don't know if they have enough to, to keep up with John Tyler because I, I think Texas High's defense is good in its own right. They have some good players. But if those two defenses cancel each other out, you, you got to go with whichever offense you think has has the best chance to, to win a football game. And right now, it's John Tyler. Um, you look at across the board, you know, very senior heavy, with uh, Geo McAllister at quarterback. Uh, Jeremy Wilson is a thousand yard rusher now. You've got good edge weapons and Nick Kane, Rodney Bendy, uh, Dontavian Gross, Damian Miller, Bryson Smith. I mean, the list goes on and on and on for John Tyler on offense. So. It's um it's shaping up to be a John Tyler victory. Um, turnovers could play a big role though. Um, if Texas High can get a few get a few uh, turnovers to go their way Friday night, um, I think it can be competitive. But uh, right now, this looks like um, this game has John Tyler victory written all over it. On to what could be the uh, the best of the fifteen sixteen five A by district uh, matchups, and uh, it's Marshall and Akadochis, two uh, former members of. Of the old uh, 12-5A, when uh, it was split up and eventually, you know, it's gone by the wayside now, but uh, Marshall and Nacogdoches were the first to leave because they uh, dropped um, from 5A to 4A. Marshall had some success in 4A. Uh, they made it to back-to-back state championship games in the previous decade, losing to uh, Ennis and Highland Park in back-to-back years. And then Nacogdoches they are really surging right now as a program. I mean, they made the playoffs last year on the heels of an 0-10 season. They're back again this year. They have some big wins this year against, uh, most notably against Lufkin. But they had a big come from behind win the we- uh, two weeks ago wow. at home against White House, which did clinch them a playoff spot. Yeah, Bobby Ray is a miracle worker. This program is entering the playoffs for the fourth time since 1965. 1965. That's 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 nuts. That's almost 50 years. Yeah, uh, it's it's um it's it's a crazy turnaround. They've got something to prove after that John Tyler loss. Yeah, most definitely, because I think a lot of people felt like John Tyler was the favorite going into that game, but my eyebrows were raised when I saw the score, and then I read about how thoroughly John Tyler dominated them. It leaves me with some questions about them going forward. All season, they've been a team that really peaks once every three games, so we'll see. We'll see which Nacogdoches team wants to show up for this one, because sometimes, you know, after the Lufkin game, you're feeling really high about them, and they, they go and lay an egg at Ennis the next week. Um, yeah, yeah. So, some, I mean, it, it's a team that, that gets up when it wants to, um, but they, they do have the talent, I think, to probably win this game. Yeah, um, Marshall, uh, although you you look at what they did, I mean, they have a huge confidence builder last week. I mean, they, 
they win a game that was tightly contested throughout against Sulphur Springs to, to to enter the playoffs. They're a lot better than they were last year. I no think doubt. I think both of these teams are really if you, if you look at it. And each each of these two teams went out in the first round last season. And um, and both both head coaches Bobby Reyes from Nacogdoches and Clint Harper from Marshall they they have visions of sticking around a while in, in the playoffs uh, beyond this round. So um, I you know you see you seem to think Nacogdoches you know takes this pretty handily, but I don't. I don't know. Um, you know, I was. I. I have my doubts now after last week against John Tyler. You know, I know they had a had a bad one um, the week after the Lufkin game against Ennis, um, but I mean, to to get beat that bad um, going into the playoffs. I mean, that that leaves me with a lot of questions about them, and and um, you know they they. I'm sure they have a lot of doubters now going into this week, and um, you know I think that's what's fueled them over these last couple of years is all the naysayers about what NAC can and can't do as a program. Well, now they've won, they've made the playoffs in back-to-back years, um, and and just the fourth time, like you mentioned, um, in the last 49 years. So um, there's a lot of interesting, interesting side. Uh, sidebars and interesting kind of uh, dynamics off to the side about this game. I, I think it's. I think it's one of the most intriguing battles in all of East Texas um, going on this week. I, I think Nack's favored. I, I'll go ahead and pick them to win, but um, I have I have some serious questions about what they can accomplish from from here on out. Just just based off of some of the bad performances they've they've put together in, in district against Ennis and John Tyler. Lose? I don't lose. I win. I win. That's my job. That's what I do. All right, now it's time for us to uh, run through our state championship picks for all of the classes and divisions. Uh, let's see, all the way from 6A down to 2A. There's there's 10 of these brackets, and we'll, we'll go through these real quick and, and give you our picks. I guess we'll start with uh, the only one of these that doesn't have an East Texas team involved, and that's... Uh, Class 6A Division 1, it may not uh, it may be void of East Texas, but um, probably the, the most competitive, deepest, and most talented out of, out of all of the brackets um, as the playoffs open up. I guess I'll go first. Uh, region 1, I've got Allen. Uh, region 2, I'll have uh, Dallas Skyline. I've got Pearland coming out of Region 3, and then San Antonio Reagan out of Region 4. And then I have, um, I have Skyline beating Pearland in the state championship game. You know, I always like blue bloods. I don't. I feel like <laughs> you, you can't be exposed too much when you, when you pick teams that have been there before, and, and that's the majority of my list here. I've got Allen in, in Region One. I've got Mesquite Horn coming out of Region Two, though. I think they're a pretty good team. I, I think that um, they can pull off an upset here. Or there, they've got some talent. Um, they should be an exciting team to watch, no matter what. I've got Pearland coming out of Region Three. I've got Converse Judson coming out of Region Four. Another historically very good program and then I've got uh, Allen topping Pearland in the state championship game. Okay. So we have um we have Allen and Skyline as our champs in uh six A Division One. Now on to six A D two. Only one team here like like we mentioned Lee and uh, uh we're both picking them to lose to Midway. Um it's just it's just five and five, ten and oh it's it's hard to it's hard to pick against against that, especially with the game being in Waco and in in, in Midway's backyard. So um, but uh, I'll go first. Region one, I have Cedar Hill. Region two, I have Midway. Um, region three, I have Manville, and then I have a uh, Cibolo Steel out of Region four. And then my uh, state championship game, I have Manville over Cedar Hill. I have from Region one, Cedar Hill. Region two, Lake Travis, another program that that consistently wins and is exciting to watch. Uh, out of Region three, I've got Katy, and Region four, I've got Cibolo Steel, and I've got. Cedar Hill topping Katie, and they've met a couple of times in the play uh, in the state championship game in the last uh, few years. So, um, all right. So our champs in six A D two, I have Manville and you have Cedar Hill. Is that right? Yes. Okay. On to five A Division one, and this is where uh, I believe a couple of East Texas teams can can make a move. Um, I'll start off in Region one. I have Alito uh, winning Region one. I'll skip ahead to Region three. I have uh, George Ranch out of Richmond. Um, coming out of that region, and then I have uh, Alamo Heights from San Antonio out of Region Four. Now, Region Two um, is where we have our teams located, and um, Longview and Lufkin—that's a big one uh, this week. I think whichever team wins that can can advance all the way to the regional final, and I'm going to pick Longview to do so. But on the other end of that Region Two bracket, you have John Tyler, and I think their path is just as easy, if not a little easier, to get to the regional final. So I have John Tyler meeting Longview. 
in the Region 2 championship game, and I have John Tyler winning, which would be a rematch of their Week 2 game. So uh, my regions are Alito in Region 1, John Tyler, Region 2, George Ranch, Region 3, and Alamo Heights out of Region 4. And then my state championship game is Alito over George Ranch. Alito wins it again. I have them uh, edging out John Tyler in the state semifinals. Well, we keep on agreeing on regions one and four, and I'm going to join you in, in region two. Just give it away, John Tyler. And I was talking to you before we, we put this together, how disappointing it is to, to see all these great East Texas teams stacked up against each other. Um, and then you look at some other places like the the Valley and the San Antonio area, not, not particularly strong. I think that um, a lot of great teams are going to meet their end early on in region two. Um, but yes, I've got Alito coming out of region one. JT out of Region Two got Houston Stratford coming out of Region Three. Uh, that's that's a program that that's done some things. Andrew Luck High, so yeah, exactly. And then Alamo Heights out of Region Four, and I've got Alito taking down Alamo Heights in the uh, championship game, which obviously means Alito tops JT in the state semifinal. All right, on to Five A Division Two and Region One. Um, don't really know about those teams much out there. I do know that uh, Canateo is ranked pretty high. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I mean, that's how I think that's the uh, technically technically the Hispanic pronunciation, Canatillo. But I mean, some people might say Canatillo. Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. I have them in Region One, Region Two. I've got Mansfield Timberview. I've got Crosby out of Region Three, and then I have Cedar Park out of Region Four. And then uh, in the championship game, I have uh, Timberview over Cedar Park, and then. Um, uh, the furthest team from East Texas, or the, the team that I picked the furthest out of East Texas in, in 5A Division Two is Nagadochus. I have them beating Marshall, but then losing to uh, South Oak Cliff in the area round. Yeah, I lived out in Lubbock for the, the past seven years, so I got well acquainted with um, West Texas football. And, and when, when you do that, <laughs> you know, it's a culture shock coming to East Texas. And um, Somebody's got to win that region, though. Right. Who's your pick? Well, I, I'm going with a more Metroplex team, and that's Everman from Region 1. I've got Ennis going all the way to the um, the uh, semifinals and uh, and beyond, as I'll explain. Uh, I've got Brenham coming out of Region 3 and Cal Allen from Corpus Christi coming out of Region 4. I've got Nacogdoches going all the way to the regional finals where they'll rematch Ennis. Um, that would be wins over Marshville. South wow, Florida, you're high on Nacogdoches. And, and Lancaster, yeah. <laughs> and then running into Ennis. Um, I, I think that Ennis... Obviously, is is battle tested. It played in a very good District sixteen five A. I think that they're going to take it. I think they're going to top Brenham in the state championship game. All right. So in five A Division two, I have Mansfield Timberview, and you have Ennis. Correct. Yes. All right. On to four A Division one, um, where there's a lot of there's a lot of parity I found when I was picking these games. Um, especially in Region 1. I'm going to go with Abilene Wiley out of Region 1. I know a lot of people may go the Stephenville route, but with Stidham, Jarrett Stidham, their quarterback's injury, it's going to be hard for them to to pick up the pieces and, and make a deep playoff run. Uh, region 2, I've got defending state champion Argyle. Region 3, I've got Navasota, which won a state title a couple of years ago. And out of Region 4, I've got Lavernia. And then um, my state champion is Navasota, who will beat Argyle for the, for the championship. And then as far as East Texas teams are concerned, uh, Van is the one I picked the furthest in 4A Division One. I. I have them going to the regional final and then losing to uh, who I feel like will be the eventual state runner-up, Argyle. In 4A Division One, Region 1, I've got Graham coming out. That's a team that usually... What a homer. Well. You're just saying that yeah. because because of the name. But let me tell you this. Uh, Graham is going to play probably play Clint in the second round. So uh, Then we'll beat you. Put some wager then we're, Yeah, we'll beat you. Uh, Graham, Graham is a team that, that usually goes very deep in the playoffs, and, and they're well-equipped for Region 1. Um, I also have Argyle coming out of Region 2 and topping Van in the uh, regional championship game, but I can easily see that going the other way. I, I think people know that um, I, I think that Van is a pretty good team and, and ha- hasn't been very tested. Um, you know, All their non-district opponents didn't make the playoffs, um, but they, they've, lit up, they've lit up some teams um, along the way, and they haven't been tested other than Athens and I think if they are uh, Matt Savis and Afonso Thomas as the running backs have um, capability to to carry the load he got in region three and four yeah basically I think that um, Van could compete with Argyle but I've got Argyle winning Uh, in region three I've got Navasota and region four I've got Liberty Hill and I've got 
Argyle beating Navasota. So we've got the same state championship game. I just got just the opposite Argyle. opposite yeah. pick. Okay. Uh four A Division Two. Um if you've noticed, we haven't picked an East Texas State Championship uh, yet, and I think that's about to change right. on, on both of our both of our counts. Uh, four A Division Two in Region One, I've got Salina. Region two, I've got Gilmer. Region three, Lamarck, and Region four, Cuero. And uh, we just referenced it. Uh, I have Gilmer over Lamarck in the state championship game. I think uh, the Buckeyes are primed for another state title. Yeah, same. Uh, other than in Region four, I've got Wimberley coming out, and I've got uh, Gilmer topping Lamarck. Gilmer's been fantastic all season. I, I think that they're going to con- carry that all the way. Yeah, it's going to be hard for anybody to stop them. I mean, nobody around here could do it, and it's going to be interesting to see if anybody anywhere else in the state can do it. So. Uh, our, our, we're, we're the same. Uh, our first East Texas pick for state champion uh, is the Gilmer Buckeyes in 4A Division Two. Now on to 3A Division One. Um, you know this has been a this has been a, a good region for East Texas in the past. If you look at some of the teams like like Dangerfield and New Boston and, and a few of the others, Tatum, which of course is now a step up into 4A. But uh, um, Region One, I've got Wall. Region Two, I've got Pilot Point. Uh, I picked Teague, who uh, some of the some of the fans here in East Texas may be familiar with. They share the same district as Malakoff. I got them out of Region Three, and then I have Hempstead uh, representing Region Four. And my state championship pick is Teague over Wall. So I have the Teague Lions uh, claiming a state title in Three A Division One. East Texas, I don't see anyone in our area getting past the second round. Well, I do. I've got uh, Region One Wall. That's a really good pick. I like Wall a lot. Um, from Region Two, though, I've got New Boston, who um, is performed very well uh, down the stretch. Uh, I'm excited to see what they do in the playoffs. From Region 3 Teague, saw them play Malakoff and, and um, pretty much have their way with a very good Malakoff team. And Region 4, I've got Goliad, uh, but I don't know much about Region 4. so <laughs> Kind of anyone's guess. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's a pretty even region. Um, but I've got Teague topping New Boston. Station. Okay, so we're, so we're, the same, uh, we're the same there. Yeah, but pack your bags because we're going to be there to see New Boston play Teague. All right, we, well... We, we, that may that very well may be the case. Uh, New Boston um, advanced to the semifinals last year, um, and then were beat by Wall. So uh, you know they may have to have a rematch with them um, going forward. Now on to three A Division two, um, also a, a possibility for some East Texas uh, East Texas schools to claim some hardware. In Region one, I've got defending state champion Cisco. I've got Wascom coming out of Region two. I've got Newton coming out of Region three. And Blanco out of Region Four, and in the state championship game, I have Cisco over Newton, which means that I believe that Wascom will lose in the semifinals to Cisco. And then uh, let, let me let me go ahead and explain my situation there um, and my justification for that. Wascom played Refurio last season in the state semifinals, and Refurio just just beat him up. I think it was like sixty nine to thirty something. It wasn't very competitive, and I figured that Refurio, you know that. That was good enough. I mean, they're going to go into that game against Cisco and just dominate them. And I was far, that was far from the case. Cisco just uh, blew me away. I was there in person. That was the night before the uh, Kilgore Carthage game. So I was in attendance for that and couldn't believe what Cisco was doing to them. So um, that's still fresh in my mind. So when those, if those two teams end up playing Cisco and Wascom, I have to give the edge to Cisco. Yeah, Cisco's a team I'm I'm pretty familiar with from from Lubbock. They travel out there and you get to see them. Um, and I've got them coming out of Region One, very good program. Got Wascom coming out of Region Two, uh, Newton out of Region Three, and I've got East Bernard coming out of Region Four. But I'm going to go with the East Texas Super Bowl. I've got Wascom and Newton in the state championship game because I don't know how you defend um, the four headed monster that Wascom has when you're Cisco. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll be interesting this, to see. Right uh, but yeah, I've got Wascom over Newton in the state championship game. I have Cisco and you have uh, Wascom is in 3A Division 2. Now on to 2A Division 1. Um, region 1, I have Canadian. Uh, region 2, I have Mart. Region 3, I have Alto, East Texas team Alto. And then Region 4, I have um, Refurio, um, state finals from a season ago. And um, I've got Refurio over Mart in the state championship game, and that uh, ironically is is the the one and two teams right now in the, in the class two A poll in the AP. Uh, Refurio won Mart two, and that's that's what I'm going with here. And I have, uh, of course, that means Alto loses to Refurio in the state semifinals. Who you got? About the same. I've got Canadian coming out of Region One, Crawford out of Region Two, Alto out of Region Three, and Refurio out of Region Four. Uh, I think that Refurio will probably get Alto in the semifinal, and then top Crawford for the state championship. 
All right, so uh, we each have Refugio, uh winning the state title in 2A Division One, And now on to the last one, 2A Division Two. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Seagraves out of Region 1, um, Albany from Region 2, the Tenaha Tigers from Region 3, and I'm going to go with Bremond out of Region 4. And in my state championship game, I've got Bremond over Albany, which would mean that uh, Tenaha would lose to Bremond in the state semifinals. Uh, what say you, Mike? Uh, from Region 1, I've got Seagraves. Uh, Region 2, Iran. Iran's a team that you keep on hearing about uh, and has is, is been pretty devastating um, in their side of the state. I think they pronounce it Ira Ann. You know, I always thought it was Iran too, but then it, then it kind of makes sense. You know, they don't want to be lumped in with the, the middle Middle Eastern country. You know, and there is an extra A in there, so I guess that makes sense. Ira Ann. I was I was buddies with um Seth Dagey, uh the, the old Texas Tech quarterback and and he was born in that place, but the way he pronounced it, I could never never pick it up. Was it was he saying Iran or Ira Ann. I think it's Ira Ann. I, I think I've heard people say that before. <laughs> but regardless, uh, that's uh, who you okay. co- have coming out of Region 2. <laughs> yeah, uh, that team. Uh, then I've got Tenaha out of Region 3 and Falls City out of Region 4. Uh, I like that matchup because that, that that's the semifinal from last year. That's right. Uh, that's I've right. got Tenaha topping Falls City and then beating Seagraves in the state championship. So you're going Tenaha. with uh, Tenaha yep. in, uh, to win the 2A Division 2 championship yeah. game. The Tigers are overdue. And I've got Bremon, so... Um, I guess, um, see, I picked one state champion from, from East Texas, Gilmer, and, and you got three, right? I've got three. I've got Gilmer, I've got Wascom, and I've got Tenaha. Okay. All right, so uh, as long as we have a spot that weekend in Arlington, we're fine. I mean, we'd love for all these East Texas teams to represent the region at, at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Um, the likelihood of every single one of them getting there, I mean, every single one of them can't get there. They're going to beat each, they're gonna beat each other uh, beat each other up during the playoffs, but – um, as many teams as we can get up there, that'd be great. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it already. I mean, the playoffs haven't even started yet. They don't kick off until Thursday night, but I'm already looking forward to that uh, to that weekend in December. That should be a lot of fun. No doubt. Uh, so many great stories, um, and it's unfortunate that some of them are, are going to be ending fairly soon. But um, very excited. I think that the region is going to be well represented deep into the playoffs, and I think that there are some good chances that, we're going to have a state championship. We will year. We will find out. All right, on to uh, recognize our uh, offensive and defensive players of the week on offense. It's uh, ARP senior running back Marcellus Johnson. 12 carries, 241 yards, and seven touchdowns in last week's game over uh, – in last week's 65-38 win over Frankston. Marcellus Johnson's one of the best uh, pound-for-pound players in East Texas, regardless of position – um, I believe he has a Colorado State offer, um, an FBS offer. He performed well at our combine back in the summer. Congrats to Marcellus Johnson, our ETSN.FM Offensive Player of the Week. Sort of like Kobe Caraway's week. The, yeah, the week almost, yeah, almost almost identical. Uh, the Defensive Player of the Week was uh, Trayvon Fuller from Athens. And uh, Y'all pay attention to, this, this, <laughs> the, to, to these stats that Mike is about to we, rattle we off. We were talking about this on the, er, in the early hours of Saturday morning, and there was no doubt. Uh, Fuller... Had three interceptions. He had a f- fumble recovery for a touchdown, and he blocked a field goal in a 52 to 28 win. Not only that, he had four offensive touchdowns, which didn't go into the factoring, but still impressive. And um, when when you when you add up all the things he did in that game, it was a 59 point swing in the game. That's that's crazy. I mean, they they win 52 28 against Wills Point, and I mean he's. You know, they say football is, is a team sport, and, you know, it takes 11 on each side of the ball, but I don't know, maybe it only takes one. I mean, Trayvon Fuller, I mean, what what more do you want him to do? I mean, he, he creates four turnovers, scores on one of them, blocks a field goal, which takes points off the board, and then scores four touchdowns on offense himself. I mean, that that's if that's not a one-man show, I don't, I don't know what is. Of course, they have other players, but th- that was Trayvon Fuller's night for sure. Yeah, Texas A&M's got to be – Patting themselves on the back for finding him early and getting him to commit early. Yes, yes, he's gonna be he's gonna be a good one down there in College Station. So, uh, congrats to our uh, players of the week: Marcellus Johnson from ARP and Trayvon Fuller from Athens. I uh, want to give a quick shout out to uh, our volleyball teams in East Texas that are taking care of business. The playoffs are a couple of weeks old now, and we've got five teams left, and all five will be playing for bursts at the state tournament in Garland in a couple of weeks. So they they play this weekend in their regional tournaments. We want to say congrats to Spring Hill. Van, Elkhart, White Oak, and Beckville, who are all through to the regional tournament. Good luck, ladies, this weekend. 
Um, also, before we get out of here, want to remind you that uh, we have previews up on some of the big playoff games that are going on this weekend in high school football across the region. Check those out. Um, the stats will be you know, have been updated and they'll continue to be updated um, throughout the season. And if you have any questions or comments uh, for either one of us, uh, you can connect to us on Twitter. Um, my handle is at Clint Buckley and Mike, you are. Yeah, I'm going to get it right this time. My Twitter handle is at Mike underscore ETSA. Right. So now if you want to complain, uh, Mike's, Mike's not hiding anymore behind a fake Twitter. All right, uh, we're going to get out of here. That, that does it for this week's of the uh, this week's edition of the ETSN.FM podcast. Join us next week, and we'll uh, we'll know who won and who lost uh, in the first round of the playoffs, and we'll probably have a a, a good idea of w- what the picture is going to be looking like moving forward. So uh, have a good have a good time this week at your games, and stay warm because it's going to be frigid this weekend. Here I go, here I go, here I go.